Let's welcome Dr. Ganesh on the stage, please. So I'm going to keep this very brief. So we'll just talk about 10 minutes. And what I want to do, because digital is a very fast evolving world. One of my favorite authors today is this gentleman called Yuval Harari. I don't know if you read his books. So Yuval Harari has written two books. One is called Sapiens, which is the history of the last 10,000 years. And he's written a new book. Of course, the newest book has just come out. He's written a new book called Homo Deus, where he talks about the next 100 years and how people will continue to have certain quests for immortality, for happiness, etc. But what I'm going to talk about is the last five years and the next five years of digital. And obviously, buzzwords like AI and blockchain and what have you play a big role in it. So I'll, I'll take this presentation very quickly, maybe in 10 minutes, in three parts. First is to tell you what you already know. How did digital happen? And what are the successful companies in digital doing? Give a little definition of digital transformation to set the context of what in the World Economic Forum this year in February was being discussed as the dark world. Now, what does a dark world mean? I'll come to that as well. So very quickly, I won't get into a lot of the slides. I'm sure the organizers can send you the slides because I really want to save time for all of us. But effectively, what we're saying in this slide is that in the next, and look at the last one, that the average tenure of companies who are really successful in the S&P 500, Fortune 500, FTSE 100, will shrink from 20 years to just 12 years. Which is why I said the tenure horizon is what you have to think about. There's nothing that stops a digital disruptor from eating your lunch and taking away whatever you do in the next few years. So we have to be constantly learning, and enough people have said that, to stay in the same place and succeed. If you look at how digital transformation has affected everybody, obviously it started with tourism, and this is a one-year-old slide which said that oil and gas probably less. But today, as I mean, we just heard in the morning, I mean, with the changes in oil prices, et cetera, even the oil and gas industry, and virtually every industry you see on that slope will have to look at digital. Whether it's digital through Industry 4.0, whether it's digital in e-commerce, I think all industries are getting affected by digital, and this is something we've seen. I mean, I, mean, I, I won't read this out because you're seeing here that some people like finance, very heavily on distributed ledgers, blockchains. If you look at e-commerce, it's entirely cognitive. You've heard the word cognitive enough times today. But in every industry, we're finding that there are new technology parameters, process parameters, cultural parameters that are changing the way we approach digital. And obviously, what's the point of digital unless it's giving us at least a 20% up in new customers or a 30% reduction in costs? And I think that's really what people are looking for today. I'll come to the end of this part of saying that what has happened with digital by saying that, look, the technology is almost irrelevant, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, we'll all talk about AI and ML and deep learning and blockchains and distributed ledgers. But at the end of the day, what are we trying to do? We're trying to do three things. One is we are trying to improve customer experience. But one of the companies I work with in the US, one of the large insurance firms, they're actually designing customer journeys at the rate of one every two days. So every two days, they'll come up with a new customer journey with different touch points to make that happen. And that's all enabled by those technologies and IoT and everything else. Enhanced productivity is obvious. I mean, I was speaking with the, with the global CEO of ABB recently and talking about his new investments in digital. They've built a factory just outside Shanghai in China, which is a robot manufacturing factory where every manufacturing person is actually a robot. So robots manufacturing more robots the entire design systems are done through artificial intelligence. So people are discovering that productivity, I mean, it raises the fundamental question, I come from India, of what happens to all the people who are being trained if everything is robotics and artificial intelligence. But that's an issue we have to, we have to deal with separately. And of course, finding new business models. Today, most of the real success stories are not people who optimize their existing business model, but actually found new business model. I mean, I was fascinated by the customs example right here in the UAE. And I think like in China, where the government is funding massive new business models, they will, you will see disruption everywhere. I mean, you, I, I won't get into this, but I mean, there are 5% of the people who have started on digital transformation can be called true digital leaders. I mean, there's quite a few still in the laggard category, but most of us are somewhere here. Either we're evaluating, we're adopting, whether it's AI or other technology, and of course, there are many, many followers as we go along. So what is digital transformation? I mean, this is the obvious one, but I mean, my favorite definition is it's a continuous process. Somebody said in the morning, it's a journey, not a destination. It's an ability to drive disruptive changes either in the market or with customer satisfaction or experience. And very important, the point I made, leveraging data, 
using AI, ML, moving from descriptive to predictive, prescriptive, everything you heard of in the last two days, but finding new business models. So this is what I think the future, the next five years of digital transformation is going to be. You've all heard of these. I mean, I, I was talking to an American friend recently, and he said 10 years back, if somebody had told me that me, a rich American, okay, would actually want to use somebody else's car and have a, with a driver I don't even know, I would have said, yes, you must be joking. But today, look at the power of Uber. Look at the power of Airbnb. So all these, the basic thing is that you don't need to own anything to create a multi-billion dollar enterprise. And this is something that many of us who come from traditional manufacturing, finance, et cetera, will realize that new business models is the way people are going in digital. Emerging business models, as I mentioned, it's moving from, and you've again heard this term enough time, it's moving from a cost model to very much a customer, employee, stakeholder experience model and moving to platforms. Multi-stakeholder, multi-user platforms is the way it will be. I know there are a few service providers in this room. I mean, I, I myself, when I was running a company in India called Zensar, we built it from 300 million to 500 million in two years just by platformizing our services. Today, if you take a company like Accenture, for instance, I mean, Accenture now claims that by investing $400 million in platform technologies, they've created a $2 billion per year annuity revenue bump. So the platform where you build multiple people together in a self-service model, I think is the way people are going. And I won't get into this in detail, but you can research this one. So what is dark? The word I used earlier. I'm coming to the last part of my brief presentation. The dark word, which is actually coined by a few people, and I mean, there's a gentleman called Paul Doherty, who's the chief digital officer of Accenture. He talks about it, he writes about it. You can see his blogs. It's all about, the future is all about blockchains. And blockchains, the D comes to digital distributed ledgers, particularly, as I mentioned earlier, for the finance industry and governments, where you will see active use of blockchains. And I'm delighted that Trescon is actively propagating blockchains. AI we'll talk, we have talked about, so I mean, we are all clear that it can transform the, future of, transform the future of work, the future of societies, the future of life. Reality, something we still have to experience. I mean, my friend Satya Nadella, who runs Microsoft, talks about mixed reality, where the worlds of augmented reality, virtual reality, all that will become part of our new reality. So we really have to figure out what world we're living in at any point of time. You'll get so immersed in new realities. Quantum computing. Something we haven't seen the impact yet. But if you look at 5G, which is the next big thing that's going to happen, you will find that there is so much of power available to you in terms of data transmission, data usage, analytics, that you will have to think. When I say you, all of us will have to think, how do we use this computing power more effectively? So if you take this combination, you'll find that AI will be everywhere. And my favorite theme of AI is we must worry about too much, too much of autonomous AI. Because as you know, a couple of Silicon Valley companies have slowed down their investment in AI, saying that, look, we don't even know where it can take us. I mean, so, I mean there is this um, story that uh, Harari talks about in, in Homo Deus, where he says that they will come when all of us, I mean, you heard the, ex you, you just 10 minutes back heard the experience with uh, Google and Alexa. But a day will come when we are so reliant on our AIs. And he talks about the story of a man goes to a bar and meets a girl and he likes her. But he doesn't ask her for a date. He tells his uh, AI assistant, the, the new Cortana, that look, maybe I should go on, go on a date with this girl. So his Cortana talks to her Cortana and decides between them that they're not compatible with each other. Gone. Do we want a world like this, where all our decision-making power, our romantic inclinations are taken away by AI? So we need to think about that. So I'm saying that is the autonomous part. But if you look at the real power of AI, to my mind, it is assistive AI, Augmenting AI, I mean, AI which can really, I mean, I, I think the customs example was a classic example of augmenting AI, where you're enabling human beings to work much better, faster because of the power of AI. Okay, and that is really what I think we should be looking for as we think about applying AI and digital in this world. Factories of the future, I think we, somebody talked about it, so I won't talk about it, but if you look at what my friend in ABB is doing, what Siemens is doing, what GE is doing with digital twins, et cetera, Effectively, what I'm saying here is not just predictive maintenance, but literally every production, materials, movement, logistics operation can be enabled by AI. So this is really what we're seeing happening. A case study, in fact, Javil Predictive Factories, which is now building new factories of the future for everybody, fully robotized, fully using AI, 
And what they're really doing, I mean, I mentioned the Cortana Intelligence Suite. They really work as a, a systems integrator for Microsoft. So these guys can, that can do predictive maintenance 80% faster, 10% energy saving. So it's no longer half percent, ladies and gentlemen. We have the potential to completely transform our existing business model, and as I said earlier, build a completely new business model. So let me end with this. There was a discussion on KPIs from KPI Soft, and I think the new KPIs of the world are going to be extremely important for all of us. So if you look at a truly digitally transform transformed or an AI-enabled organization of the future, what you will find is there'll be a transformation of, if you look at the experience piece, the second bar I told you about, omni-experience transformation irrespective of where the customer comes to you, on his mobile phone, on the website, or whatever, you will find that the KPI will be to repeat business and attract new customers all the time. And don't forget your competition is doing it as well. The middle part is workforce transformation, which is obvious. Work optimization, talent, upskilling, and reskilling workforce. I mean, I was glad that in the Bahrain presentation you heard that, because I think the big task that countries will have to take up is how do we make sure our workforce continues to stay relevant? Are there technologies available out there that we can actually encourage people to continue learning? Because there is no such thing as, I have learned enough, and now I have a job for the rest of my life. The middle part is, of course, what we call operating model transformation, which is obvious, the business process piece. If you look at information transformation, I think the revenue generated by new business models will have to be a key KPI for any organizations. Because your current business model, however much you tweak it, is not going to be relevant for the customer of the future. And finally, the leadership transformation, obviously. I mean, when all of us as leaders are tasked with building competitive share, both in your core existing market and your new market. So how does a CEO become the CXO, the chief digital officer, and drive transformation? My own experience working with companies in the US and Europe and China and India is that it is the hands-on CEO who's driving transformation in digital. These will be the leaders in the post-digital world. So just to close, I think we have a concern, which I was discussing with a few people, and I think the point that came up, I think um, even from the legal point of view, that can we allow AI to completely take over the world? Should we worry about trust? Should we worry about ethics? Should we worry about how human beings in a truly cyber-physical world can lead the transformation? Because I think we must do that to leave a more responsible world for our children and grandchildren. Thank you very much for listening to me.